Welcome back, Commissioner Willie, Commissioner Fye, Commissioner Rogers. We are just about 10 seconds, Madam Chair, for the YouTube stream to start, and we are good to go when you are. Double mute. Welcome everybody to the Tuesday, April 27th, 2021 Board of Commissioners meeting. Mr. Kevin Moss, our board clerk, take it away. Thank you, Madam Chair, the Board of Washington County Commissioners, also meeting as the Board of Directors for Clean Water Services and all other county service districts is now meeting in this regular session, April 27th, 2021. Commissioner Willie. Here. Here. Commissioner Rogers. Here. Commissioner Fye. Here. Vice Chair Treese. Here. Chair Harrington. Here. All righty. Uh, before we move forward with the agenda, uh, I'll announce uh, just uh, one change under presentations. Senator Lou Frederick uh, was called away. So the second presentation will be rescheduled a different day. But before we go further, we're going to take a moment to remember Congresswoman Elizabeth First. Uh, Elizabeth First served as the Congresswoman to Congressional District 1 from 1992 through 1999. She passed away last week at the age of 84. We're going to take just a few moments to remember her and her legacy. Clerk Moss, could you cue up the video, please? Elizabeth Furs served Oregon's first district in Congress from 1993 through 1999. She was born into a British military family in Nairobi, Kenya, and grew up in Cape Town, South Africa. It was a time of apartheid. Her mother was a civil rights activist who formed a protest group of white and black women against apartheid. First, a teenager and her mother were beaten during one protest. It formed an intense desire to do more. She told the story to her daughter, Amanda, several times. A deep sort of unwavering belief in the power of social justice and the importance of having a voice, uh, to have a voice against power if necessary, even if it puts you at risk. Elizabeth eventually moved to the U.S. after meeting and marrying an American doctor. Amanda and her brother John grew up in California and then Seattle. Her mom supported farm workers and the activist Cesar Chavez and a boycott on grapes. My brother and I probably never had grapes in our entire life because our whole childhood was the boycott. <laughs> so she was a very um, engaged social activist her entire life. Their mom loved books and art and gardening. Really that for both my brother and I was the place that we connected, you know, on a more personal level with her. I mean, she was always busy and always engaged in projects. Gardening was her real passion. In Oregon, first became the director of the Oregon Legal Services Restoration Program for Native Americans from 1980 until 86, helping tribes win back their federal recognition. As activists, we, can, we have to have faith in ourselves and faith in our own motivation and say, we're going to take the first step. It was then that she testified in front of Congress and decided to run for office. And she won. In Congress, first pushed for money to extend the light rail into downtown Hillsboro and was a passionate advocate for women and children and for cutting military spending. She fiercely went after what she believed in and paid attention to the things that affected people's lives. When her daughter Amanda developed diabetes in her late 20s and told her mom about the many things needed but not covered by Medicare or insurance, her mom helped pass not one but two laws that changed that. Amanda mentioned it to a friend. And I said, you know, in a funny way, that was my mother's way of giving me a hug about having diabetes. And my friend said to me that your mother gave a hug to everyone who had diabetes. After six years in office, first said she was done with Congress. I think that six years is enough. I believe in term limits. I believe we need new blood in this office. Daughter Amanda was there at her side. Sometimes in the harsh rhetoric of our modern national politics, it's easy to believe nothing ever gets done. But Elizabeth First made lots of things happen, pushing for civil rights, 
making a difference in the lives of many. She died April 17th at her farm in Hillsborough. She was 84 years old. Pat Doris, KGW News. I'd like to thank our staff for obtaining that video. And uh, at this point in the agenda, I'd like to ask if any commissioners would like to make any brief remarks in remembrance of Commissioner, uh, excuse me, Congresswoman Elizabeth First. Commissioner Rogers? Sure, I'd be happy to. You about uh, gave an early demise to one of our other commissioners. That's probably not, uh, I don't know if you caught yourself. You said, uh, anyway, you, you, I knew Elizabeth, uh, worked with her. I always uh, admired the uh, tenacity that she had. I always, uh, I, I guess I shouldn't say this, but I really liked her accent. It was, <laughs> it was a wonderful accent and uh, was very pleasant to listen to. And she was very in, engaging. Uh, she uh, uh, it always surprised me after so much national notoriety that she uh, came back to little old Washington County and made her home here and did all of the things that uh, were important to uh, preserve that legacy. So. I don't think I've ever met her daughter. I, I, again, I met Elizabeth on a lot of different occasions, but her daughter looks just exactly like her. So congratulations for that. You uh, certainly are emulating a, a wonderful human being. So that's my remarks. Any other colleagues? Go ahead, Commissioner Trees. I ha had the opportunity to meet uh, the Congresswoman on several occasions. And I have to say, I was always struck with just the passion, the energy that she brought to conversations about almost any topic. I mean, it was, uh, there was, there was just a, um, a really strong personality that resonated with, uh, with the, the feeling of um, equity and, uh, Inclusion, you could just tell that that was, that was part of her, her DNA. And when I didn't realize the story, I knew that she was from um, South Africa, but I didn't realize the story about her participation in apartheid. So that explains some of it to me. And she is, she, she's part of the, the, the network of, and the fabric of Washington County. So she will be missed. Thank you, Commissioner Treese. Anyone else? Um, thank you, Chair, if, if I may. I didn't know the late Congresswoman, but I do want to send her family and to her kids uh, my condolences. I feel like she was a, a sister in spirit, having heard that and learned that she was born in Kenya and myself living in Kenya and all the social justices that she fought for. Um, we are benefiting. Um, I hope her kids take that into uh, as a consultant um, and all the wonderful things that she made it happen. Um, she'll be greatly missed, uh, but so many are alive and will benefit all the things that she made it happen. So my condolences and uh, sorry to Amanda. Thank you, Commissioner Fai. Commissioner Willie. Yes, uh, similar to um, several others, uh, I had some interaction with um, Elizabeth, especially during the light rail coming to Hillsboro. That was that was a pretty big deal, and we certainly appreciated her support and commitment to that. And and the the video gave me a lot of information that I just didn't know about her. But um, yes, she was a a great woman. We're going to miss her. Uh, because it was always good to just be able to reach out and talk to her. And if you really wanted to, you could um, you could go have a glass of wine with her at her winery. <laughs> and she was always open to that. So, um, yes, um, we will certainly miss her. And we appreciate her commitment to getting things done, certainly in Washington County and in Congress. Thank you, Commissioner Willie. I'll close with. Uh, through this video, we had the opportunity to hear about her efforts in improving the world on a really grand scale. 
the anti-apartheid efforts, the uh, work that she did in Los Angeles, working in Watts, LA, with the farm workers movement in support of Cesar Chavez, her work in Congress, serving us for three terms. Uh, but then also her passionate work here in Oregon, working with Native Americans through the remainder of her life. Uh, but she also kept up an active civic engagement as well. At a personal level, she was one of multiple high level elected officials who encouraged me to value and operationalize land use care for time immemorial and for racial equity as well. It's certainly not easy, but it's absolutely necessary. So I feel very blessed that uh, she played a role in my political life, in my career as a public servant, as I know she has had for many. And our work continues as a result of her investment in us. So our future will be brighter as a result of her contributions. Thank you colleagues for recognizing uh, Congresswoman Elizabeth first this evening. And with that, we'll move on to the published, published agenda. Clerk Moss, oral communication. Do we have anyone signed up this evening? Yes, Madam Chair, we had one person sign up, Olivia Stone. Olivia, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead for up to two minutes. Great, thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Olivia Stone and I'm a Beaverton resident. I was raised in Washington County since birth, attending Sunset High School, and um, I've chosen to live here and put down roots as an adult with my husband. I love and I'm passionate, passionate about civic engagement, especially at the local level, because I've seen how much of an impact that it can have on communities. So thank you for the opportunity to testify before you tonight. I'm joining you to share some thoughts on some comments I heard made by Commissioner Roy Rogers at one of your public meetings last week. Um, as we know, Commissioner Rogers has been a public servant in Washington County for a long, long time, um, first taking a seat on the Board of Commissioners in 1985 for District 4 and has held that seat ever since. Um, having just won his last election, I believe he's entering his 36th year as a member of the board. So you can imagine my surprise, and I'm sure the surprise of many Washington County residents when during the meeting last week, he announced to members of the board that he'd be bringing forward a term limits proposal and asked for support. Um, that somewhat perplexes me. And while I can't draw any firm conclusions, I find the timing a bit curious because right now, as far as I know, for the first time ever, there's a female majority on the board of commissioners and there is um, a chair of the county that's a woman. And for the first time ever, there's a woman of color wearing a hijab as a symbol of her faith sitting on the board of commissioners. While I don't presume to know the motives behind this proposal, I do see these facts and wonder what else could be driving this new policy direction. Um, I would love to hear the rationale behind this proposal or have it withdrawn as it doesn't seem to be something Commissioner Rogers has ever supported in the past over the 36 years he's served as commissioner for District 4. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Ms. Stone, uh, I do want to highlight a few things. Uh, Commissioner Rogers has been serving District 3. Uh, Commissioner Willie is serving in District 4. Um, but also, uh, this is not the first time that there has been a female majority on the Board of Commissioners. Uh, early in Commissioner Rogers' tenure back in the 1990s, uh, Commissioner Rogers served with four uh, colleagues, female colleagues on the commission. And uh, I am in my 31 years of living here, the third uh, woman chair uh, elected at large. So just a, a few items that I wanted to try and ensure 
you've had the benefit of. Commissioner Madam Rogers. Chair. Yeah, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to address that issue of, uh, offline because I know we have a busy meeting tonight. But uh, uh, just uh, contact the office and I'd be happy to change, uh, give you uh, my uh, concept. Uh, we're uh, going into a full-time uh, paid professional board. We've not had that before and that was a driving factor on why I feel that we need to take a look at term limits. But uh, give, the, uh, give the office a call. I'll be happy to call you back and we can chat about it. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. Mr. Moss, uh, that was it, just the one? Just the one for this time period, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Next, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Tonight's consent agenda consists of five items. Two items under clean water services, one item under assessment and taxation, one item under the Office of Community Development, and one item under land use and transportation. What are the wishes of the commission? Commissioner Rogers has moved acceptance of the consent agenda seconded by Commissioner Willie. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand or thumb. Commissioner Treese as well. Uh, any opposed? The motion carries unanimously, five to zero. Thank you, colleagues. Next, we'll move on to our first of two presentations. Oops. Uh, Clerk Moss, how are we doing for our speakers? Are they available now? They are available, Madam Chair, and I'm bringing them over right now. There you go, no oops then. We're right in line. We'll turn it over to our colleagues from TriMet. Uh, John Gardner, welcome. And you're going to help share with us uh, the public safety presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Oh, there's my presentation right there. Okay. Um, just give me a moment. And I see Tom Markgraf, one of your colleagues, is here. Are we expecting anyone else that we need to? advance out of the attendees list, do you know? We may be joined by uh, Marla Blagg, our executive director of uh, safety and security, but okay. um, I think she's available if there are questions. Um, okay. So, uh, but thank you. Um, thank you again, uh, chair and fellow co and commissioners. Um, once again, my name is John Gardner and I direct TriMet's Transit Equity, Inclusion and Community Affairs Department. Before I get into the formal presentation, I also want to thank you we had a partnership with uh, your clean water services division and we were able to um, provide over 200,000 masks to folks across the Washington County and other areas through your, your department. So it was a great partnership and it really helped a lot of culturally specific and community-based organizations connect with these very important resources. So thank you so much for that. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna go over uh, our reimagining public safety and security on transit initiative tonight. And then at the end or, or at any point I can stop and, uh, and take questions. Now, I don't know if it would be possible for me to present from my own screen or should I just tell your staff next slide? Next slide and Kevin will advance it. Okay, well, let's go ahead and just get started. It's, oh, sorry, will you go back, Kevin? All right, so um, last spring, after the death of George Floyd, calls for racial justice and policing led to candid conversations about race, safety, equity, and the need for lasting social change. As the public transit provider for this reason, TriMet took this opportunity to rethink and to reimagine our approach to safety with a focus on helping everyone feel safe and welcome on the region's public transit system. This effort formally began last July when TriMet made the first step by redirecting 1.8 million in police contracts and additional funding to explore new community-based services to expand our safety approach. Next slide, please. So as part of this effort, we took a series of immediate and short-term actions and began pursuing long-term considerations as part of this year's budget process. The first was to conduct a massive community-wide listening session and outreach effort. Next, we established a regional panel of thought leaders to inform new community investments. And finally, now we're in the stage of piloting some new community informed investments as we get ready to implement the action plan. Next step, uh, next slide, please. So as we developed this project, we knew, 
to study. We knew that we could not conduct the work in a vacuum, and we worked to stay connected to other efforts, both locally and statewide. Efforts like the Reimagine Oregon effort initiative, as well as the Governor's Racial Justice Council. And although the conversations around racial equality in the community, as well as safety, are still unsettled in some areas, we were very excited to begin our process and get through it over the last 10 months. Next slide, please. So we approached this project like a very, uh, very much like a research project where we brought in a local research firm. We partnered on the design with the Coalition of Communities of Color in terms of the community engagement process and just the framework of the project in general. We worked with local researchers to look beyond our, our region and, and try to figure out what was happening across the country in other transit areas as it relates to safety and security. And we actually turned over our data, a historic safety data to Portland State and asked them to look at uh, issues that were occurring amongst our data to see if we can learn any from that uh, information. Next slide. But the heart of this effort, and, and I think the success of this process, is we built this project in partnership with community, and it was all about community feedback. Next slide. So over the course of the initiative, we worked with over 42 community-based organizations, many of which I'm sure you recognize by their logo and their agency names. But, but for them, we, were not, we would not have been so successful in this effort. And this is a group that led all of our outreach, whether it was the online surveys we conducted, the focus groups, the one-on-one -on -one interviews, the phone interviews, as well as the interviews in across multiple languages, which I'll talk about later. After this uh, initial outreach, we then convened a group of local leaders. Next slide, please. That would take all that information gathered and help us develop the formal recommendations for moving forward. Next slide, please. At a glance, I think you could, if not recognize the name, recognize the organizations. And we, we felt like we did a great job of bringing in the right sort of stakeholders across the Tri-County area, both folks representing uh, senior communities, uh, communities with disabilities, culturally specific providers, youth providers, um, behavioral health providers, houses experts, as well as uh, former general managers from other transit properties and law enforcement to make sure we had the right stakeholders at the table to inform what TriMet would be doing next. Next slide, please. But it was important before we got too far on this process to ground all of the committee members with TriMet because I think a lot of people think they know TriMet but they don't really understand the scale of the operations. So next slide, please. First, we wanted to talk about who we are as an organization, beginning with our diversity. Uh, very much like the, the commission here, we have a majority uh, women and men of color led board. Uh, TriMet's executive team is also a majority in women and men of color. And I believe we actually have, for the first time, an interim general manager who's an African-American male. As far as our staff, we are very diverse and actually more diverse than the city of Portland. And that's across all 3,300 of our employees. And it was just important for our committee to understand we are, we hire from the community, we are the community. Next slide, please. But just as important, it was important for the committee to understand the scale of our operations and the scale of the work. So we, we couldn't just be thinking about incremental change. And it was important that our committee understood that we serve the Tri-County area, which is about 500 square, over 500 square miles. We have 142 max platforms. And every morning, 700 buses, even during COVID, so 700 buses roll out of our garages. And so when we talk about making systemic change to safety and making the system more welcoming, that's the scale we want them to think about for this project. Next slide, please. We also do a lot to understand and listen and engage our ridership. And we know a lot about them. And going back to a normal year, we're right around 100 million rides. We do know that 37% of all trips taken on TriMet are taken by people of color, and 40% of their trips are taken on the MAX system. We also know that about 36% of our ridership is at or below the federal poverty rate, and the language spoken by at least 6 to 8% is not English as a first language at home. We use a lot of the American Community Survey data, and probably like you and your team, we're very anxiously awaiting the updated census data, so as we do changes, we take in consideration what's really happening with the demographics of our region. Next slide, please. The other thing we wanted our committee to know was that this project was not something happening in isolation and that we do a ton of community engagement every month. And like many other public agencies, we have a lot to improve on, but we feel really good that we have a forum every month to talk about transit equity issues. And again, we do so with a, over a dozen community-based organizations from across the Tri-County area. 
So whether it's language access or committee on accessible transportation or just our writers club in general, we do a ton to try to keep people engaged and informing us on how we can do better. Next slide, please. And I think this was the older, one of the examples of sort of something we did in partnership with the community a few years back was our fair changes, our equity and fair initiatives through our reduced fare program. And uh, right now we're about 34,000 people who have signed up for a low income fare program to save up to 72% off the cost of fares. And that's just an example we use to show the committee that their, their work with us would be powerful and have powerful outcomes. Next slide, please. Another thing that we, we spoke about was our equity through infrastructure efforts. Um, it, it's a point of, of pride for me to say that TriMet is the leader in minority and contracting and women-owned businesses across the region, and actually have the largest award to a minority forum in the state's history through the Division Transit Project. And I think this was the older version of the presentation, but I can still go through it, except for I cut it because there were some slides that were not as, uh, I think there was a ton of slides, but I'll, I might go shorter on those slides if they're still in this. Next slide, please. So finally, we got down to public safety and that's what we convened the committee to do. But again, we wanted to orient them towards who we were as an organization. Next slide. And again, before you make changes, you need to understand where we start. And so we have a, a variety of folks on our system providing safety and security and customer service on a daily basis. But the vast majority of staff you'll see on a trim uh, on the system are, are probably ride guides and customer service reps, followed by actually our contracted security personnel. We work with both G4S as well as Portland Patrol Inc. We do have a fair inspector group, but that's around a dozen folks for the whole system. So you generally, historically, we've only been able to inspect maybe 2% of the fares in a year. So I think uh, there might be a time to time confusion on who's doing what. And lastly, we have historically relied on transit police. Uh, and these are police officers assigned to the transit division from multiple municipal police forces across the region because we believe community policing is the, is the way to go when police are necessary. Next slide, please. But like many other systems, we have, have had a series of challenges over the last year, obviously COVID-19 and the pandemic, but historically things that you probably could resonate with in terms of database challenges or just IT and, and trying to upgrade the technology of our system, staffing shortages, not just for TriMet, but also our contractors. Um, and then of course, the constraints of budgets and what you can do through contracting. And we also are aware that we also have infrastructure challenges as well. Next slide, please. But when it comes to sort of how we relate to other transit properties around the country, what we found is that for uh, transit properties that provide around 100 million rides a year, when it comes to our safety footprint, we're actually fairly small. Um, whether you look at Denver and, and when you look at the blue, these are sworn officers, generally police officers across these other transit properties and the orange are contracted security. Um, relatively, I, I want to say one of these uh, agencies maybe provides 110 million, but the rest are right around 100 million. So you can get a sense that TriMet's security footprint is relatively small. And one of the things we worked with uh, community on a few years ago was making sure our contracted security were unarmed. And that is different when you look at like Denver or King County. So although we might have a, a good sizable unarmed security uh, force compared to Denver who has an armed security, contracted security, or even King County, we were relatively a small a footprint. Next slide, please. And unfortunately, what that has meant over the last year is a, a dramatic increase in customer complaints related to security. So this is just one of the things we, we track uh, uh, related with our customer service office. And this represents, this graph represents about 200 phone calls where I wanna say 70% were asking for more security on the region's public transit system. 19% uh, wanted more fair uh, enforcement. We did see, and I'm not sure if that's 1% or whatever that is, but we did see a call for less fair enforcement at 7% and then some less security. Next slide, please. So when it comes to uh, safety and security, we, our executive director explained to the committee, what we were really focused on was more use of non uh, police, but high trained security personnel, um, and that we were pursuing a partnership with Multnomah County Sheriff's Office and other current law enforcement partners for a balanced approach, but focused mostly on a community enhanced uh, policing model. And again, more proactive friendly rider interactions and a focus on de-escalation. Next slide, please. So getting back to the outreach, 
so this this project was remarkable in many ways, but the biggest way was this represents some of the most uh, feedback we've received from our ridership and our community in, in a long time. So obviously, I don't need to tell you what's been going on over the last years, but to get 13,000 responses to our, our survey and our outreach related to safety and security during COVID, during the protest and during the, the fires was, was fairly remarkable, but it would not have been possible without those community-based organizations you saw earlier. And you can get a, a sampling of the language skills and services they brought to the conversation, which allowed us to really engage a ton of folks who ride the system and, and need to be part of the conversation. But we recognized that we couldn't just rely on technology and a lot of these providers provided in-person socially distanced one-on-one -on -one interviews as well as focus groups. And, and then of course, I think just like you were learning that social media, especially across these languages is a growing source to connect to these communities. Next slide. Now, what did we find with all that outreach and feedback? These are just some highlights and we removed our own staff uh, feedback, but what we heard from our writers was Essentially, um, folks feel safer on bus than Max. We believe that's because when you enter the bus, there's someone greeting you. And sometimes in the Max compartments, you're separated from the driver. The reasons for feeling unsafe on the system was generally other riders or the lack of TriMet staff presence, especially transit police. Reasons for feeling more safe we found were lighting, presence of other riders, security cameras, and TriMet staff. What we also found was that seven in 10 uh, Folks feel welcome on TriMet, which creates an opportunity for those other 30%. And those who feel less safe and less welcome tended to be people of color, Blacks, Native American, Latinos, individuals living with a disability, females, or, and also non-binary or other gender identity and non-English speakers. Safety and security types that people liked the most were on-street customer service and unarmed security. And those who wanted more safety and security staff tended to be people of color, Black, Native American, uh, people living with a disability uh, and seniors, as well as females. Next slide, please. Here's an example of one of the respondents, the questions we, we got a ton of feedback on. What made you feel unsafe on board TriMet buses? Other riders, and generally the behavior of those other riders, but the number one response was a lack of transit police, not only for the 12,000 respondents, but when we isolated the BIPOC community, we found that this was the number one choice of black respondents, and as an aggregate, the number one choice of people of color, which at the time, this was uh, last summer, so basically August through September. And despite what was happening in, on our streets, this was what we heard. Um, in fairness, all, uh, if you look at this, you'll see that presence of transit police for about a third of the respondents was also an area of concern that made them feel unsafe. Next slide, please. So we did a lot of focus groups with our own staff, but also the community partners as, as well. And we found some agreement, specifically when it comes to what we could be doing as an agency to uh, move this conversation forward. Both agreed that our staff need more training and the community believes we need more training, specifically in anti-racism, cultural humility, mental health, and de-escalation. There was a lot of interest in the formation of a new service related to crisis intervention teams, specifically for folks on the system dealing with behavioral health crisis or alcohol and drug issues. And there was agreement from both our staff and the community that they'd like to see us continue to increase the number of culturally specific employees representing the different communities we serve across the region. And then you can see other things like more infrastructure improvements like lighting and more securities on board. Next slide, please. So some of the things we wanted to make sure people understood before they started making recommendations were just a few of the things we've done to date. One thing, for example, is we've changed the TriMet code so fair evasion is not a crime on the system. Um, police no longer do routine fair uh, inspections. Um, we, like I said earlier, we have increased the number of unarmed security. We've changed the rules related to interfering with public transit. Um, my department has done a ton of civil rights and de-escalation and non-confrontational trainings. Next slide, please. Uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis and Portland are only the only two transit properties in North America that have ever looked at its citation outcomes. We work with Portland State twice now, and we've done it every three years, and we're going to do it again after the pandemic to make sure there's no systemic bias in when it comes to who's getting fit, cited or warnings or anything on the system. And over the last uh, six years, we found no bias, or sorry, Portland State found no bias. Um, we have pulled the fair citation process out of the courts and turned it into more of an administrative citation review. 
Um, we removed the fair uh, citation fine from $175 to $75. And if you can't pay that, you can do community service or sign up for our low income fair program. So we've, we've done a lot just to kind of get to this point. But like I said, this whole process and project was to do more. Next slide, please. And so that's where that committee you saw earlier came in. Uh, it was a very focused group. Uh, we, we have videos, we, we streamed all of the meetings. We met, uh, as this slide says, over the course of four weeks and we had amazing dialogue. We gave them a ton of research, which you, you all just saw the tip of the iceberg. 500 pages of research of different reports of different findings and they made across 14 hours next slide please and what the themes they found in terms of what they what they heard from our writers what they heard from stakeholder groups in terms of where the 1.8 million dollars could be going was generally systems presence there was a lot of interest in this crisis response approach better more community partnerships better more outreach and communication a better and more training and technology and we asked them to really focus and, and we rated their choices. And next slide, please. And what we heard from them was essentially um, a lot of interest to, if, if we were gonna use these resources, they th thought it would best be spent by making sure our staff were equipped uh, and understood and had training in anti-racism, cultural humility, mental health and de-escalation for all Triman employees, specifically our frontline employees, and the formation of these new crisis intervention or writer support teams focusing on people uh, experiencing behavioral health crisis and generally in a more uh, unarmed TriMet presence on the system. Next slide. And what that resulted in is three formal recommendations from the committee to use the $1.8 million to move forward in these three areas. So TriMet's leadership took, uh, next slide please. So it's, I'm, I apologize because I had such a better updated version, but this is, this is still good. So all of these committee recommendations are going forward and we've been working on them over the last few months. When we received the initial recommendations, our leadership went back through the surveys and the community focus group reports and we pulled out an additional 22 activities like infrastructure improvements and things that the committee didn't believe it had the resources to pursue that our leadership wanted to continue to build out. Um, so we have an even more robust approach that we're going to be moving forward and trying to timeline and budget for it in the months and years to come. Um, we are going to continue our regional policing approach. Right now, we have a partnership with Multnomah County Sheriff's Office, who has taken over the management of our transit police, which we did hear from, the, uh, like you saw earlier, our ridership that although there is a lot of unease with some policing models, that if we're going to work with police, the, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office was an approved partner. And we're still looking to build out other municipal police partners to the extent we need it. But more and more, we want to rely less on police and more on all these alternative community safety methods. And that we're committed to community engagement being part of this and innovation being part of this work going forward. Next slide. In terms of next steps, Currently, we are building out the uh, communication process. I've, I've been able to give this presentation to many, many different groups, and I think a few of you have seen it before, apologies. Um, we are per getting ready to stand up a new advisory committee that we will send you the link to, the follow-up that you can share across your region, where we want, again, we wanna have a community to help us push this work forward and sort of advise us, made up of community stakeholders, because um, it, it worked all along this process. And we're continuing to build out the strategy. Obviously, we, what you saw was a lot of the what and now the how. It's time to build out the how and we wanna do that with our stakeholders like all of you in, in the community. So that's kind of where we're at next. Um, next slide, Aha, questions. So that's a lot and I speak fairly quickly and I don't mind going back to any of those slides or, or however you'd like to go forward. Well, colleagues, do you have any comments or questions that you'd like to share with our TriMet partners? Commissioner Willie, oh, excuse me, Commissioner Rogers. Hi, John, how are you tonight? Good to see you. Great to see you, sir, long time. Good, well, I haven't been that long ago. We, uh, I listened to your presentation not long ago and I, that's, that's I'm, I'm a little afraid to say anything nice about you because I keep inflating your head. I tell you what a great job you, you and Tom there do and, regards to uh, your work. It, it, it's terrific work. It was exactly what needed to be done. And uh, I, I think uh, so, no small part of that goes to Bernie and to Doug as well. I think you guys were a, a good team, but uh, uh, it's terrific. The only question I had, and I didn't ask it last time I saw your presentation was, uh, where do you go from here? 
The great question. Uh, so we have hired a program coordinator specifically to focus on those three recommendations as well as the other areas to build out. She's forming a community committee. We don't want to get too far ahead of the committee community on this, even though we we have our marching orders. There's a lot of details to build out. Um, so the the budget that you saw that 1.8 is a is a is a going forward number. Um, some of the things that we're still looking at will cost way more than 1.8 million dollars, and so we have to start looking about how we can afford to, especially something like the crisis team, right? So having groups of folks working across the system at the same time, different parts of the county, the counties, is going to take a lot of work. So it really is time to just build out the the actual work plans for all of those recommendations and beyond. Other questions. Or comments, commissioners? Go ahead, Commissioner Whaley. Yes, thanks for the presentation and that information was was really helpful. I'm glad that you uh, went through that process to do that. Um, the question that I've always wondered is, um, as far as the collection of fares and the fare enforcement, uh, it seems to me that uh, if you know that there are, uh, are no fair checkers uh, on the system itself, uh, that the compliance of uh, paying for a fare is going to significantly go down. So what is, uh, I guess, what's the philosophy behind that? And um, correct me if I'm wrong on uh, people going for a free ride. No, that, that's a good question. And so we are a proof of fare system, uh, but we're also an open system, which kind of unique, like in, in a lot of those other major cities I showed you earlier, they have gated systems, especially on their, their light rail vehicles or their subways or whatnot. Historically, we've, we've gone between a 12 and 18% fare loss rate in terms of folks of choosing not to pay. Um, but for the most part, every time we do these annual surveys around fares, Generally, uh, three, only around 3% say the cost of fare is a problem. I, we did, when I started at Triman around five and a half years ago, we only had around five or six fare inspectors. And now I think we're up to a dozen. So we, we have seen an improvement. But I think it's, it gets back to that community conversation because uh, we feel really good about the fare subsidies we have in place. But you know, this is everybody's system. And I think a lot of folks want to see it grow. They want to see it go to alternative fuels. They want to see it expand. And that's going to cost resource. And, and so in, until we decide to find some other funding mechanism, it, it'll continue to be a proof of fare system. And, and we'll have seepage like every other public transit system, even those systems that have uh, gates and, and whatnot. So, you know, it, it's a it's a challenge, but I do think we've done some things and, and Marla and her team have done some things to kind of slow it down. And I think as riders return, right, as, as we all sort of emerge slowly from the pandemic, we'll have sort of that nice community social um, everybody doing their part, hopefully, which we I think we had during, before the pandemic, and, and I hope to get back to that. It's nice to see you, John. It's been a while, and you too, Tom. Thank you both for being here tonight. Um, my question is, do, do you, the data is great, and it's, uh, it's really comprehensive. Did you notice much difference between counties or did you split between counties? Should be my first question. And uh, if so, did you notice differences in uh, the demographics or in the uh, responses? We did split. And, and so we have a ton of data tables and a lot of that is on our, our website, which also has the videos from the meetings. Um, and I, you know, to be fair, I, I was a little surprised, especially because we when we did the surveys, um, and, and there was, uh, I was surprised by some of the findings, specifically, let me talk about Washington County. Um, your, your respondents, your, your uh, respondents of color and your respondents who speak English as a second language are pro-safety, pro-security. And it, to be fair, um, your Latino respondents were very much wanting to have more safety supports because they, there was a fear, a greater percentage of fear of other writers. So at least they knew what to expect if there was a, a TriMet presence or a safety presence. So I think maybe counter to some of the narratives that we were hearing last summer or in the fall, people of color want safety too. They just want it to be representative of the, their communities and they want it to be responsible and they want to understand how to, if that there's transparency. But that was the biggest response uh, that the, probably the largest group who wanted more of a, a, a safety presence were Latinos and limited English speaking communities. Great, thank you. 
other questions? And I know you guys have a full agenda, so. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Fai. Thank you, Chair. Um, hi, John. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. This is the second time I'm hearing your presentation. Uh, the first time at the committee you were presenting, I was listening, so I wasn't able to ask any questions. Uh, but I did want to ask, uh, along with Commissioner Tree's question, uh, the data, because what the data is right that you presented is really saying is people of color, BIPOC, want police, want more police. And that isn't what I'm hearing. So is there a way to get these data so that we can understand and the breakdowns of it? Um, I just need a little more help understanding uh, the data uh, of what you presented. And then that's one question. I'm mm -hmm. a fan of uh, asking all my questions at once and then letting you process it out um, and answer. And then the second question is really about what have you learned? Um, you know, the you, it sounds like you did a really, uh, and when I say you, I mean Trident, not oh, yeah. particularly. <laughs> um, uh, Trident did a, uh, in terms of this project, really robust uh, community engagement. Uh, what are some of the lessons learned uh, from, in terms of best practices around community engagement? And then the last question, and then I'll be quiet, um, is, you know, I'm, a, you know, I believe in TriMet, and uh, I love TriMet. I'll just say that on record. Uh, and and support transit, you know, system and um, mass transit transit system. I I want to. I don't know if there's any data available, uh, but I do want to see uh, the breakdown of charges uh, based on race and ethnicity. If TriMet does provide some of that information, uh, and how that racial profiling um, um, is applied to, uh, and then. Um, yeah, I think um, I just, this is a great project. I love reimagining public safety. Uh, it, there's a little bit of disconnect for me around the data and, and I wanna invest and believe in it. And uh, especially for uh, the communities that are uh, definitely impacted. So those are the questions I have. Um, and then great, um, yeah. the two PSU studies that you mentioned. Yeah. So, so uh, let me start at the end with that. Is I'll, I'll forward those to you so you can read. Those are very rich data reports. They have some of the information you want about the years and the citations and the demographics, because it's a it's a it's a data study to say you know from a data standpoint is there a bias in the outcome. So it's sort of a blind study and just looking at the results. I think that those are great questions. Um, in terms of the community engagement, the lessons learned I had is. Uh, it's we're very much uh, moving towards trust, move towards the trusted source, right? So um, if we want to work with the community, then go, who are those community experts already working with those individuals that use our system? There's a relationship we have with them as a TriMet customer, but there might be a better relationship they have with a partner within Washington County Strive or in, in something or Central Cultural, for example. Like if we really want to have candid conversations, sometimes it's important for us to be in the room and sometimes it's important for us not to be in the room and let them talk to their trusted social partners and, and you know who those are in Washington County, right? And so, so that's kind of the method we went. And I think that's why we got, I mean, we have a report from each one of the community-based organizations in terms of the recommendations their community gave to us. And that's why we're, we're going beyond those three recommendations you've seen. But again, leveraging that expertise and those relationships that the community-based organizations have, that was, it's not a new thing, but it was just clearly proven, especially during the pandemic, that that could still work. And to your, your point about, um, the data. So one of the things that I, you know, we went into, I think, in one of the other reports was when we launched this, there, there's, there's definitely data, and we can get you the data, there's definitely a difference between uh, 35 and below and 35 and above, right? And so, so in, and we also saw a campaign that was happening, I think, on Twitter that was really trying to get people to have basically banned the police on TriMet. Like it was a 20, like 2,400 responses that was like, hey, do you guys want to get police off the train? So, so we we didn't take that out of the data. Those are real thoughts and opinions. But when you looked at the respondents, uh, you know, especially in the demographics I spoke to, 
older people of color were like, oh, no, no, like, like we, we would prefer, and it wasn't police as the number one favorite, it was more TriMet presence, it was more safety presence. Uh, folks that sp spoke English as a second language, that, or is, that was the same thing. So I think what we've seen, generally speaking, in the media is, is really a, a strong emerging young professional, young advocacy core, but it's not so great, although it's taking up a lot of the energy. It hasn't surpassed the vast majority of ridership or whatever you wanted to call it, where people are like, that's all great, but I'm riding home tonight on the MAX train, and I would really love to see someone in a uniform just to make it seem, so I think that's what the data told me. Uh, it'll be interesting in the next few years if that shifts any, but I also think that we're peripheral, although we do partner with municipal police forces. It's only one of the things we do, and, and on, generally speaking, in a normal day, there's not more than eight transit police assigned to the whole transit system across the whole three counties, right, because there's three shifts. So, so it really is a customer service staff. So what we found from our writers was that although the conversation about community policing is unsettled, other than very specific uh, advocates, which God bless them, we really weren't getting a lot of pushback that we were over-policing our system. And, and that's across those 42 organizations. Now, I think four or five of them are like, you guys need to stop this or, or abolish or whatever. And we took that and that's incorporated into our findings. But that's not the majority of what we heard from any demographic. It did tend to be more progressive the younger the respondent. And, and we can show you that data, but we saw that across each of the three counties and probably doesn't surprise anybody. But it, 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 was, it was a great research project just in that aspect. But uh, I mean, I think you know, things are changing, but I think most of the focus over the last 10 months has been on municipal uh, communities use of policing. And, and obviously we partner with that, we're, we're a small element. So it wasn't really the focus of the pushback, although there was some for sure. Did that answer some of those questions? I'm sorry, just, there's a lot. Good questions, good questions. And I'll, I'll get you those PSG reports so you can look at it. And I would love to, to talk further after the fact when you have more time. Thank you. Well, you got a thumbs up from Commissioner Fi, So you did well, Mr. Gardner, in responding to those multiple questions. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, thank you very much uh, to you and to Tom for uh, or Mr. Margraf uh, for joining us this evening. Uh, TriMet really does keep people moving throughout our region. Uh, we wouldn't have as many employees moving uh, to and from work in a cost-effective manner. We wouldn't have as many people from all ages, all backgrounds, all income levels, able to get their everyday needs met without having a highly functional uh, public transit system. So I thank you very much for the work that you're doing. I know that TriMet is very customer uh, service oriented and I appreciate your coming and sharing the program results uh, to date. The what, as Mr. Gardner put it, and now as you move forward into the how. So thank you very much for for spending some time with us this evening and giving uh, the members of our Washington County community the opportunity to hear you present this information. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. You as well. And you don't even have to commute home from Washington County tonight. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move on then to our second of two presentations. And this one is an internally driven presentation. Uh, recently, uh, we adopted a new set of commissioner committee assignments. And with that came a change, a change to the Board of County Commissioners uh, representation to the Regional Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation, also known as JPACT. In order to make uh, room for new leadership and different voices at different transportation tables. So I wanted to ensure that Commissioner Rogers uh, has the benefit of hearing uh, how his uh, decades of service to, uh, to the region, 
on behalf of Washington County and the Board of Commissioners is greatly appreciated. So with the help of staff, I reached out to our congressional delegation and we've received two letters, uh, one of which has been shared with Commissioner Rogers at the April uh, JPACT meeting. So with a little bit of help from Clerk Moss, if you would. Here we have a new letter for you, Commissioner Rogers, one from Congressman Earl Blumenauer, who I think you uh, first served on JPACT when uh, he was a Portland City Commissioner at the time, uh, and also a uh, representative, a local representative to JPACT. Well, he's been serving us well in Congress and uh, I'll just read the letter. Roy, you've been a proud Madison Senator in the great tradition of distinguished alumni like Rick Weiss, the only major leaguer to pitch a no hitter and hit a home run in the same game. You've played a key role in the development of the region's transportation future, as well as its present. You haven't just represented Washington County, which is such a dynamic part of our region's fabric. You have reached out and listened to understand the dynamics and bridge the gaps. And you did all this while having a real job on top of your assignment as a county commissioner. We are all indebted to your commitment to our community. You're helping us formulate policy bridge differences and get things done. I deeply appreciate your many contributions and your friendship. I know you will continue working on these issues and think about how we make the community better. Sincerely, Earl Blumenauer, Member of Congress. We also have a letter from a representative, a congressional representative, uh, Suzanne Bonamici, uh, whose district includes Washington County. Uh, this is a letter that uh, was also presented at the uh, Joint Policy Advisory Committee. Dear Commissioner Rogers, I understand that this week you will complete your service as a member of the Metro Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Tran Transportation, JPACT. On behalf of a grateful region, thank you for your many years of service in this important role. During your time as a member of JPACT, you've seen and influenced unprecedented growth, planning and development in this region. These are challenges that already have and will continue to shape the region. Your work has built the foundation for future growth. Your advocacy was instrumental in bringing light rail to Washington County, including building the West and making sure the red line went all the way out to Hillsborough and in highlighting how transportation is critical for a city's economic growth and development. I have long appreciated that JPACT brings a regional approach to transportation issues because in the tri-county area, people's lives, people's daily lives involve travel throughout the region. Residents travel between counties for work, school and recreation. Our transportation infrastructure is critical for helping people get where they need to go safely and efficiently and also for facilitating the freight movement that is essential to our trade dependent economy. You've been a champion for that regional approach and we are all better for it. And while champion, a re championing a regional approach, you've been an outspoken voice within the region for Washington County's needs and for Washington County's residents. Again, my gratitude for a job well done and for your lasting influence on regional transportation planning in the Tri-County region. Sincerely, Suzanne Bonamici, Member of Congress. So with that, Commissioner Rogers, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we took a moment to thank you for your multiple decades of service. Uh, 
in representing us at the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation for 35 years, for making at least 20 different JPACT trips to Washington, DC, bringing that regional perspective on transportation and a countywide perspective to the regional table through the Washington County Coordinating Committee meetings. And of course, promoting the values of leverage and partnership. Thank you, Commissioner Rogers. So, and with that, we will move then to the uh, boards and commissions section of our agenda. And pardon me, there we go. Uh, the first item is to approve the health council appointments. Uh, we have a request to appoint Stephanie Rose as a new member and reappoint Mary Monnet, Danielle Berner, and Lynn Schroeder and Rebecca Jones to the Washington County Behavioral Health Council for a term date ending March 31, 2024. What are the wishes of the commission? Is there a motion to make these appointments? Motion from Commissioner Willie, a second from Commissioner Roy Rogers. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. Um, and Commissioner Fi, here is the topic you were looking for. I believe we were earlier thinking of this as the uh, consent agenda topic when we were talking earlier. So um, today we have a motion to appoint uh, a commissioner to, to the planning commission uh, for just one of two as originally posted. Uh, we have a proposal to appoint a position for District 4 for a term uh, serving through January 31st, 2025. And if I have this correct, the person that we are appointing is, am I right that that's Benjamin? Uh, Chair, this is uh, Stephen Roberts. I think uh, we were going to look for some direction tonight from Commissioner Fye and Commissioner Willie to confirm their uh, uh, preferences. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Commissioner and, Fye has let us know that uh, she wants to uh, hold on the District 1 appointment. And that's why I was just going right to the District 4 appointment. Commissioner right, Willie, thoughts? Uh, Benjamin uh, Stadelman is my uh, uh, choice. Okay, so uh, uh, Commissioner Willie, I take that as a motion to appoint uh, Benjamin Stadelman. Is there a second? Second from Commissioner Rogers. And uh, Madam Chair, before before the vote, I did want to note, unfortunately, we transposed the dates in the requested action for the two different terms. So the District 4 appointment will be serving a term through January 31, 2022. Thank you. And um, the District 1 appointment, when we make that one, will be for a term through 2025. Okay, so as far, as far as the motion goes, it will be to appoint Benjamin Stadelman through January 31, 2022. Yes, and just to uh, further clarify that, uh, the conversation was realizing you're just, uh, this person is completing a term with the expectation that uh, they will come back around and um, again, apply for the next four-year term. So we have some continuity there and uh, there isn't a lot of time spent um, 
on a short-term person and then we change. And so not that that's automatic, but that was the conversation I was having just to make sure they understood um, that really the expectation isn't uh, an eight month position, so. That's correct. Yeah, so this, this appointment would be eligible to serve two additional four year terms. Okay. Uh, and I just want to confirm with your second, Commissioner Rogers, you're on board with all that. Great. All righty. So uh, unless there are any other questions or comments from commissioners, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. Thank you, commissioners. Next, we'll move on to the action section of our agenda, and that is uh, to uh, approve an amendment to the rules of procedure. Mm. Mr. Rapelier, is there any presentation? Yes, members of the board, uh, thank you. Uh, we've had a presentation on this uh, for a couple times, so uh, this should uh, seem very familiar to you. And so we're basically doing a, a bunch of cleanup on the rules of procedure, not a whole lot of sub substantive changes. As you go through the agenda, you'll also see that there is a highlighted version of the uh, rules that have the uh, new language in yellow and the uh, language stricken out. You know, section 2G allows for the use of digitized signatures that have made our life a lot easier. Uh, we've added language about uh, completed meeting packages in section 3B. Uh, 4B, uh, we agend, uh, amended the section to reflect our current uh, meeting practices for the times. Section 5 is the only thing you haven't seen before. Uh, that was come, uh, came from Clean Water Services. We uh, changed the title from the Clean Water Services Manager to the current title of Chief Executive Officers. The, uh, probably the most substantive change we did was we basically just removed all the provisions for uh, group presentations. It was just complicated and cause confusion. So we just limited to had one uh, set time for people to make their presentations. Uh, we uh, just cleaned up some provisions in section C4 about uh, presentations. Uh, we amended section 11A uh, to make it more clear about how we do committee appointments and uh, reflects our current practices. Section 11C allows appointments of boards and committees members who are not residences, uh, which we have already done. And section 16D uh, just clarifies adds clerk to the board. So with that quick presentation, I'm available to answer any questions about the changes to the rules of procedure. Commissioners, any questions or comments? No, I will close with, I think these are uh, good changes to our rules of procedures as we have reviewed them at our work session in the early part of March. So with that, do we have a motion to uh, approve the amendments to our rules of procedure? Any commissioners? Commissioner Willie, thank you for the motion. Do we have a second? Second from Commissioner Trees. Any last questions or comments? All those in favor of adopting this amendment to the rules of procedure, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Thank you, commissioners. Any opposed? Seeing none, the motion carries unanimously five to zero. Thank you very much. That is the end of the action section of our agenda. Mr. Board Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have one last one speaker signed up for this section, uh, Joy Culver. Joy, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead for up to five minutes. Oh, cool. Okay, I gotta go pick up my grandson. He got up work at 720. Um, so I'm gonna try to read you what I had to say. First of all, I'd like y'all Thank you. Should I turn off the phone? Would it be better? Yes. Okay. I heard some laughing going on in the very beginning about the raccoons and the skunks. And I'm here to tell you that I kind of take that a little personally and it's not a joke at all. 
I had sinus surgery three years ago and I'm really sensitive to smell. And I try to open my bedroom window at night to try to get some fresh air and some moisture. And what I get is smoke from the neighbors burning. And every morning at 6, 6.30, my bedroom is filling up with skunk. And I got to close the bedroom window. Now, I just had a chemical problem with my broiler. And I had to call the unsmoked people in to try to get rid of this chemical smell that I've lived with since March. Off and on, if I turn on the kitchen fan, which I did once, then the whole house smells like chemical again. So it's really important for me to be able to open the windows and get fresh air. And I haven't been able to do that in over a year. So I'd like to quickly read to you what I wrote. So you have all the ideas. And the neighbor across the street said that the neighbor behind him had caught over 40 skunks. These people across the street, this nice couple with this cute little, uh, little boy. He's a little person and a little brother. Their dog has gotten sprayed seven times and it got sprayed the first time, the very first night they moved in. These skunks are tunneling underneath the sheds. They're tunneling underneath the people's decks. They're tunneling underneath the porches. They're tunneling underneath the foundations. And I'm sure you wouldn't want them tunneling underneath your house. So I'm sorry, I'll read this really quickly and I appreciate you're all listening. So our community matters. Somerset West is being overrun by raccoons and skunks. We want the county to do some controlled hunting. There should be enough money, extra money in the budget to do this or change policy. They carry disease and they're damaging property. They're digging holes under the fences and they're spraying pets. We cannot keep our pets in the yard and as fast as we fill in the hole, another hole appears. We can't leave the windows open for fresh air and the pets are getting sprayed and the houses and the garages stink. We can't take a walk or drive without the smell of skunk. I walked from my house down to West Union trying to get exercise because I've had two aneurysms and I've got bad discs and I've had to put off surgery twice. And I've been trying to stay away from people because I'm high risk. And six different times I ran into skunks just from my house down to West Union. Went to pick Andrew up and he just got a job at the pizza store. Went to pick him up at at the apartments at Bethany last night. And you have to stop at the sidewalk before you can turn left on Laidlaw. And while we're sitting there trying to make a left-hand turn there in the parking lot, my car starts filling up with skunk. There's a skunk there. So Fish and Wildlife and Animal Control will do nothing. I retired from US Customs and I worked for Fish and Wildlife for Animal Damage Control before that. When I first bought my house in 1990, and I had to retire in 94 on disability, Bud was one of our trappers. They all worked off of donations. But Bud came out, and he, he trapped the raccoons several times for me. But he retired, and then I can't get anybody to do it. So the county needs to trap on our property and relocate and euthanize. We cannot control the fruit trees, the neighbors leaving food out, Overgrown blackberries. The neighbors let animals go under the porches and decks. Critters are multiplying like rabbits and they're carrying rabies and disease. They leave turds in the yard and looks like dog poop. Please do the right thing and get this wildlife under control for our community. It should not be the property owner's responsibility. We pay too much for the property taxes already. Money's tight with the pandemic. Help us out here. I would like some reasonable accommodation. And so when my neighbors, they were over there remodeling and she just got brand new appliances and her dog got skunked twice on the deck and got in the house and ruined everything in her house. They were putting nose clips and throwing up trying to get the smell out. And this has been like eight, nine months ago and it still smells like skunk in her house. They've done their floors with everything they can possibly think of. So we can't control the people around us. I've used Bob Villa's solution with uh, chopped up onions, uh, jalapeno pepper, and cayenne pepper, and boiled it for 20 minutes, put it in a squirt bottle, and tried to run down the fence with that. I've got balance and, and head issues and memory problems, and I've got 100 arborvitae around my backyard. It is so difficult for me to try to get behind the arborvitae to fill in a hole. And I'm running, out of, I'm running out of dirt and soil trying to do it. Nobody's doing it from the other side. 
And this lady behind me for the first time in 20 years finally cut back the blueberries, which I'm sure was just feeding the rodents. So, I mean, they were just having a really, really rough time and we could use some help with this and get it under control. Thank you, Ms. And I Culver. I think you could help. Thank you, Ms. Culver, uh, for sharing the difficulties that you're encountering uh, with, the, with the skunks. Uh, I think we've, we uh, have asked some of our staff to be on board tonight to give us uh, a short briefing uh, right here and now so we, that we could learn more about county provisions for this kind of wildlife animal control. So at this stage, I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, Ms. Tanya Angie, our county administrator, and she'll introduce our staff for enlightening us further. Thank you, Chair Harrington, Board of Commissioners, and Ms. Culver, thank you for taking the time to share your concerns that you're experiencing. I'd like to introduce Marnie Kyle, who is our Health and Human Services, Health and Human Service Director, to um, provide an update. Thank you, um, Ms. Angie and uh, Chair Harrington. Um, Ms. Culver, I'm, I'm really um, sorry. Um, it sounds like it's an extremely difficult situation and um, I, I certainly um, feel bad for you and your neighbors. It can be really difficult to deal with this. Um, the, the unfortunate piece is that we don't, um, the County Animal Services does not have um, the authority, um, the staff expertise, nor the ability to trap um, local wildlife. Um, and I, I know that um, we've given information about fish and wildlife, but um, I think because of the prevalence, just the sheer number of skunks and raccoons in our county in Oregon, um, I, I would guess that they're hesitant to do this kind of trapping and relocation. Um, the best um, advice that we give residents that are facing this kind of difficulty is um, the names um, and contact information for um, private um, wildlife um, uh, abatement services. And um, it, I would encourage you to call our animal services or I believe that we have contact information um, from Mr. Moss that we can ask our um, animal services team to give you a call and give you a list of potential abatement services. So, um, I, you know, I, I am sorry about your situation, um, but we just don't have the authority nor the um, expertise really to um, assist you. Mr. Rapelier, uh, were there any comments you wanted to share? Uh, no, I've uh, looked up at the animal service code and there is nothing in there about that. I've known uh, that there have been contracts in the past with US Fish DNA, but uh, that must have been many years ago that we've done that. I know cities also have contracts with the U.S. Department of Agriculture to do some trapping, but this is not in the city. Well, well, can I add a comment, uh, Marnie? This is for you and Alan, probably before you arrived at the county. Uh, we understood the significance of these kinds of issues, and they happen to not just be skunks. They're rats and mice and mosquitoes and anything that we call a vector, I'm not sure, and maybe Alan can educate me where the term vector came into being, but it was called vectors. And so we uh, went out with a, a, two measures, one to, to uh, form a vector control district, overwhelmingly supported. The second measure was, will you fund the vector control district so we can do the work, overwhelmingly defeated. And so uh, we stood with a uh, good intentions uh, with the vector. I, Alan, unless you can tell me otherwise, I think the Vector Control District still exists. Right, we still have one. Funding. <laughs> it's an unfunded district with no, no money in it. So, and the, the only vector um, control abatement that we um, have authority for is um, mosquitoes um, at, this, at this point. So we do um, abate mosquito difficulties because of the risk of human disease like, like West Nile virus. Thank 
All righty. Well, a very unfortunate situation, uh, certainly, uh, and aggravating uh, to say the least, um, but also can be dangerous as, as Ms. Culver noted, uh, sometimes skunks can be carriers of different diseases. So um, it's, a, it's a tough situation and is also very smelly and irritating. So I'm really sorry for you, Ms. Culver. It's, it's really a, a bad situation. Mr. Moss, do we have anyone else signed up for this evening? Thank you for joining us, Ms. Kyle, by the way. Uh, we have no one else signed up, Madam Chair. All right. So uh, next on the agenda is board announcements. So I'll make the usual announcements looking ahead on our calendar. Our next set of Board of Commissioners meeting is next Tuesday, May 4th. May is here already. Board of Commissioners work session starts at 8.30 in the morning, a board meeting at 10 and reconvening the work session after that. We will not be having a round table during the month of May because we have other activities coming up. Uh, we have a Clean Water Services uh, Budget Committee meeting on Friday, May 7th. Then on Tuesday, May 11th, we have a Board of Commissioners work session starting at 8.30. On uh, the evenings of May 12th and 13th, we have Budget Committee meetings. On Tuesday, May 18th, 2021, we also have a pair of meetings, work session at 8.30, board at 10. And then we're into the month of June. Boy, summer is on our doorstep. Uh, meetings start on Tuesday, June 1st. We will not be having a round table in June as well. Then we pick back up June 8th and June 15th. So that's just a preview of the calendar of upcoming board meetings. Are there any other board announcements uh, for tonight for many commissioners? Madam Chair, I'd uh, quickly like to say thank you for the uh, recognition on the letters from the two congressional folks. I, I didn't say it, those are awkward at best, uh, you know, having acknowledgements, but uh, I want to say it's been a pleasure serving on the uh, JPAC for a number of years. And, uh, I was very humbled at the JPAC meeting. It was about a half hour tribute the other day. I, I didn't expect any of that. So um, anyway, thank you. Uh, and I would uh, be happy to make a motion to, uh, to adjourn if there is no other business. Well, uh, Commissioner Rogers, I wanted to make sure that you knew that your contributions of service on those very various committees was appreciated. Uh, though I know the transition for WCCC is going to take uh, some months of time, so thank you. Uh, so Commissioner Rogers has made a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting. Is there a second? Second from Commissioner Willie. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye or raise your hand. Thank you, commissioners. Anyone opposed? The motion carries unanimously five to zero. That's it for Tuesday, April 27th, 2021. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, and have a wonderful evening.